In this episode of Reproductive Rebel, we're going to be talking about something that fires me up. There is a term called menstrual normativity. What is that? In this week's episode, we're going to dive into just what menstrual normativity is and what it does for the disembodiment and objectification of women and what you can do about it. Hi, I'm Adrienne Irizarry. I'm an Eastern medicine practitioner who is passionate about women's health and helping women live their best lives. My goal is to put you in the driver's seat of your menstrual health, offering period solutions for a symptom-free life. Statements made in this program are for educational purposes only and not intended as a substitution for medical consultation or advice. We do not claim to diagnose, treat, or cure any diseases. This podcast is inclusive and welcomes all gender identities. The focus of the program is on biological function, and we will use the term women throughout, but it is referencing physiological and social challenges for biology, not identity. Come as you are. I am happy you're here and welcome all performances of identity. I hope you find something helpful in this show. Welcome back to another episode of the Reproductive Rebel Podcast. This is a topic that I love to talk about, and I actually just ran across this term not all that long ago, and I think it's important to raise some awareness around a concept that I always understood in its execution, but didn't realize that there had been a formalized term created for it. So what is menstrual normativity? Menstrual normativity. Have any of you heard that word? I was not familiar with it until recently, and it really captures a significant challenge that bleeding bodies face in the conversation around how our bodies work. So this concept is written about by Josephine Pearsdotter. I really hope I pronounced her last name right because she is a brilliant academic who has done a lot of work on this particular topic. I cannot take credit for this brilliance, but I do have to say that I really appreciate how she is raising awareness around it. This isn't a term I had been familiar with before doing the work that I do now, and I think it's an important topic, like I said, to raise awareness about. Because menstrual normativity explains how women's internalization of menstrual conversation contributes to their disembodiment of self-objectification through menstrual management. That is a mouthful. What does that mean? It means that the narrative of the medical system and the menstrual hygiene industry has established women as quote-unquote diseased and unable to know their bodies. Isn't that awful? I don't know about you, but that horrifies me that the medical system and the menstrual hygiene industry are the biggest culprits behind why our culture literally knows nothing about how bleeding bodies work. I don't know. I think it's bullshit. But let's talk about why periods are so taboo. It comes out of menstrual normativity. Yeah, that's a mouthful. But talking about periods has become taboo and is shrouded in secrecy as a result of the way that this conversation has been constructed. And the concealment of being a bleeding body is an imperative form of social control and a body project that keeps women disembodied. Our voices have been taken from us and we have been reduced to parts because of this construct of menstrual normativity. Let's put this into tangible terms. Think about all of the memes that you've seen about the menstrual monster. Premenstrual women being characterized as raging beasts or living on emotional roller coasters. We've all laughed at them. Heck, I even use some of them in presentations that I give because they're so common in our culture. But I use them strategically to raise awareness that this is the cultural perception of a woman's body. And it wasn't until I was introduced to this term, menstrual normativity, that I realized that this is how we got to bleeding bodies having 
their negative symptoms be quote unquote normalized. I always wondered how we got to that place because women's bodies were revered and celebrated and honored and wars were fought over women. (laughs) And yet we have reduced the power of being a woman to these menstrual monster symptoms, which really does disembody us and disempower us and take our voices away. So the cravings, the water retention, the bloating, the cramps, the moods, we make jokes out of all of these. But it's part of a more toxic conversation around women's bodies. This is the kind of stuff that I founded Reproductive Rebel for because I wanted to start talking about some of these things that we have started to accept as normal. And it's not normal. It's normalized. And there is a big difference. We talk about birth control as solving problems. We have normalized that as part of the conversation, and yet there is nothing normal about it. There is no normal function that takes place in a woman's body when she's on it because it influences the expression of her hormones. So being presented as a monster positions women outside of the system. It positions you as an outsider and abnormal and a burden to society. Think about it. How many of you felt shame around your period coming or are an adult and still found themselves questioning this level of shame around the fact that you're menstruating? I've had clients come into my practice that say that they have to hide Their feminine care products. And when they're bleeding, they have to change the lining in the trash can every single day because their partner is horrified that they are a bleeding body and they shame them for it. That's how insidious this conversation has become, how toxic this conversation has become. We're positioned as outsiders and abnormal. And yet, it's just the opposite. Think about all these terms I've just used. Monster, abnormal, outsider. These position us to feel shame. When we have nothing to feel shame about. I remember when I started bleeding, I used to tuck a pad up the sleeve of my shirt and scurry to the bathroom. Like I would leave my classroom. I would go to my locker. I would put the pad. I would literally look up both sides of the hallway, slide the pad up my sleeve and run to the bathroom. I remember that feeling of panic the first time I had my period when it was closer to summer weather and I didn't have long sleeves to stick the pad in anymore. And I was like, oh my God, how am I going to get this to the bathroom? I'm pretty sure if I had a photo from that time frame, I probably would have been nine shades of crimson because I was so fearful that somebody was going to see me. And I look back at that now and I realize just how insidious this is because I subconsciously had been taught through culture and social stigma that it was shameful and I should feel ashamed when I was bleeding. Does anyone else resonate with this? This is so important. And this is one of those podcast episodes I hope you listen to more than once because As you think about it, as you listen to it, you realize just how deep this goes in the fabric of how all of us were raised. Does anyone else resonate with this? Being a bleeding body isn't bad. It's not abnormal and there is nothing wrong with you. What is wrong and really truly a crime and my whole practice is built around righting this wrong, is that we aren't taught about how our bodies work from the beginning and what they are doing. We aren't taught, oh my gosh, if I had a dollar for every woman that walked through the door of my practice that said, 
oh my God, Adrian, in this first appointment, I learned more with you than I have in 30 years. Where were you when I first started my period? I wish everyone knew this. It's wrong that we aren't taught about our bodies from the beginning and what they are doing. What is wrong is that we are shamed for a normal biological process in our body that we have no control over. We have no control over the fact that we bleed. It happens because we were born with a certain set of hormones that perform certain functions. We were born with a certain set of anatomical parts for certain systems to work certain ways. You had no control over that. I had no control over that. And yet, that insidious larger social context shames us for the fact that we have these things happen inside of our bodies like we have control over them. This is how our culture, our narrative keeps us small and steals our power. Bleeding bodies used to be revered, even worshipped. I mean, think about depictions of the goddess of Willendorf. She was curvy. She was fertile. She was worshipped for her fertility. And this was normal. Because from a bleeding body, life was birthed. Your lineage continued because bleeding bodies birthed life. It was magical. It was mythical for many cultures for thousands of years. Enter the modern world and all of a sudden we're dirty. Why is that? It is a normal part of being female. When we learn to harness its gifts, it can be our superpower. Now, I know some of you kind of are probably laughing at the idea that your period can be your superpower. It's not just the period. It's the symphony of hormones that happen all month long that give us certain gifts. There is a reason that we are hormonally different than our male counterparts. And again, I'm talking about biology, right? Assigned at birth. Because we're talking about hormonal processes that are naturally occurring in the body. Our male counterparts experience their hormones in a 24-hour period. They get bursts of testosterone. They go to bed feeling the same way. They wake up feeling the same way day in and day out. It makes their stamina different. It makes their mental faculties different. It makes their emotional spectrum different. They experience their world differently than a bleeding body does. A bleeding body goes to bed one day, wakes up the next day and goes, oh my gosh, what did I do yesterday that makes me so damn tired today? Well, maybe it wasn't anything. Maybe it has everything to do with where you are in your cycle, right? But we're not taught to look at it that way because of this menstrual normativity, insidious subtext in our culture that tells us that we need to feel shame around feeling being a woman, that our power is stolen from us because of a lack of education. If you teach people how to think, then they're dangerous because they can question a system that is broken. They can critically think around information that's being presented to them. If you don't teach them, they don't question. Think about how many things in the menstrual hygiene world and the pharmaceutical allopathic Western world benefit from us not having the information to make informed decisions and critically think around things that are happening to our bodies. I pause there for emphasis. And again, like I said, this is an episode to listen to again, because I think as you listen to it, different things are going to stand out to you. Because we're talking about something that we have been indoctrinated into. We were born into this conversation. And for many of us, we've never been taught to challenge it. And as I started doing this work, (laughs) I remember my husband 
came into my office and he goes, are you going to rage at that computer the entire time you're in class? <laughs> because I found that the more I knew, it was kind of like sliding down the rabbit hole when Alice goes into Wonderland, right? And I remember the more I learned, the more angry I got. And at the beginning, it was anger. I've now alchemized that anger into action. But at the time, it was anger because I thought it was absolutely bullshit that I had made some of the decisions that I had made in my life. And I thought that I was a pretty well-informed consumer. I read things. I researched things. I'm a lifelong learner. I always loved learning things about my body. I was very fortunate that I had a mother that was very open about things happening inside of her body. So I did question probably more than the average person did. Not everybody has that kind of experience and that kind of relationship with figures in their life to be able to teach them this kind of information. And honestly, sex ed in high school is reduced down to the penis goes in the vagina. This is how babies are made. If the penis goes in the vagina, be really careful that they don't have an STD because here's all of the bad things that can happen to you. And they lead you to believe overtly or not that you can get pregnant all month long, which scares most young people into using birth control. Because they haven't been taught how their body works. They go, oh, shit. Well, I don't want a baby, but, you know, nobody's going to tell me I can't put the P in the V. So, you know, I'm going to do this birth control thing in order to prevent it. Well, let's also say that birth control is only 85% effective, folks. So it's not a safeguard guarantee. Abstinence is the only thing that is 100% effective in terms of not having babies. But you know what? Fertility awareness education, when done correctly, is like 99% effective. That's way more than 85. But again, if you teach them how their body actually works, that makes them quote unquote dangerous because now they can question the system. Now they can question all of the bullshit that they've been fed and this is why I was getting so angry as I was going through my coursework because I'm like, oh my goodness, I would have made so many choices in my life differently. I was part of that allopathic model. I'm not sitting here saying that I haven't been. I had endometriosis right from the jump and as a young teenager was put on birth control and not because I was trying to prevent pregnancy. Like so many, I was put on birth control to, quote unquote, control symptoms in my period, which after 10 years of taking it, landed me in the emergency room at 25 with a heart attack. If you haven't had an ep opportunity to listen to episode 35, definitely check that out. I've shared pieces of that story all along here, but just think like how many decisions you would have made differently in your life if you only had the information. I have clients when I start sharing this stuff with them when we're in our one-on-one -on -one sessions and they go, oh my God, Adrian, I would have chosen different partners. I would have chosen different things for myself. I would have had fewer infections. I would have had less mood issues. Like, And the list goes on. And it all has to do with this disempowerment that takes place when we aren't taught how our bodies work. We aren't taught from the beginning what they are doing because then that allows the narrative to be controlled. And that's exactly why the show is called Reproductive Rebel, because I want to help pull back the veil. I want you to have the information so you can make informed decisions about what feels aligned for you or not. If that's birth control, fine. If you've done your risk analysis and you've decided that you would much rather, you know, set it and forget it and take birth control and not have to think about babies and, you know, as concerned about some of the risks that go along with it, that is absolutely your prerogative. My goal with this program is to empower you with information so that you have the level of discernment to be able to make that decision. 
because the part that pisses me off and why I was raging at that computer as I was going through the eight years of education that led me to where I am now is the fact that we don't even get to make that fucking choice. We don't get to make that choice because they take that choice from us. And I'm using capital T, they, because this is the system that we live in. This is the system that we've been born into. And it's time for the system to go away. It is time for us to reclaim our power and normalize conversations around being bleeding bodies and remove the veil of shame because it doesn't deserve to be there. You deserve to feel like an empowered goddess every friggin' day of your life because you understand you have the sovereignty to make decisions that are aligned for you, your values, because you have all of the information. Hormones and surgery aren't the only options available to 99% of the population. Are there outliers? Sure. Are there reasons that allopathic medicine needs to step in for intervention? Yes. If I'm having an ectopic pregnancy, I sure as shit want to have a skilled OBGYN on the other end of that surgical scalpel to save my life. But I have clots and cramps and you're going to just offer me hormones? No, thank you. That almost got me killed. And I know plenty of other people who have long-term health issues as a result of depending on a system that pushes pharma as a solution for what really boils down to a hormone imbalance that is driven by a lack of information. Think about that for a second. Your body gets out of balance because you aren't taught from the beginning how to care for your body in every phase of your cycle. And because of that lack of education, you now have period problems. You want a solution for those problems, but it could have been prevented from the beginning. Doesn't that make you angry? I know it does me. I think about all of the decisions I would have made differently. I never would have ended up in the emergency room with a heart attack. But you know what? I think I had to. I think I had to walk that storyline in order to sit here today and say, you deserve to know how your body works. You deserve to not feel shame around the fact that your body bleeds every month and there isn't anything wrong with that. Our hormones change and they give us creative abilities. They give us planning abilities, multitasking abilities. They give us gifts. These hormonal changes give us fucking gifts. And yet all we focus on is the period is shit. And I only have a few good days out of the month that I actually feel like a normal human being. It gets like that because we aren't taught how to do meaningful self-care through every stage of our month. And why is that? Because if you teach people to critically think, they will question the system. So Reproductive Rebel is here to help empower you because you deserve to be able to make aligned decisions for your current and future goals. You deserve to not struggle with fertility issues because you didn't know that 10 to 15 years on birth control was going to seriously hinder your ability to try to get pregnant when you were ready. You deserve to know that there are parts of this month your face is more symmetrical. Get your headshots done then. You have more energy. You're more articulate. You will put your best foot forward every flipping day of your cycle if you know what is going on inside of your body and you can plan your life for it. You deserve that. Just like I said in episode 35, women's health is not just being passionate about women's health and helping women to live their best lives is not just a tagline for me. It is my mission to empower you 
so that you can make informed decisions for you. It is your body. It is your life. And you deserve to be in the fucking driver's seat of your life. You deserve that. You deserve to be the sovereign queen that you are. And you can only achieve that. You can only have that if you have the knowledge of what is going on inside your body and to be able to make mindful decisions about how to care for this vessel that you live in. You deserve that. We deserve better as women, as bleeding bodies. We deserve better. You deserve better. And I'm here to help you get there. Thank you for joining me for another episode of Reproductive Rebel. Reproductive Rebel is recorded by certified peristeam hydrotherapist, herbalist, sound healer, and Chinese nutritional therapist, Adrian Irizari of Moon Essence, LLC. If you are interested in setting up an appointment with Adrian for one-on-one support, ordering from our store, or checking out our course offerings, visit our website at moonessence.life. Be sure to subscribe to our newsletter to get insider information on upcoming events and offerings. Join the conversation. Like us and follow Moon Essence Me on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Your voices make this program possible. Thank you all for your continued support.